Hey, good evening and uh, welcome to uh, Casa de Wheeler for our Good Friday uh, reflection and uh, communion service for uh, First Central. Uh, we're glad that uh, you had the opportunity to uh, join us, to uh, tune in. If you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to uh, grab some uh, bread or crackers, some beverage of some kind so that you can celebrate uh, communion with us in a little bit. Uh, Carol and I are using a, a bagel and some uh, iced tea tonight. Uh, we figured uh, a bagel has yeast in it, but it is kind of Jewish. So we hope that uh, qualifies. And uh, what we want to do tonight is to reflect on what Jesus Christ uh, means to us, as well as celebrating communion. And to do that, what I want to do is focus our attention in the uh, book of Isaiah, probably one of the most familiar passages of the Old Testament, uh, one of the most familiar passages of uh, the book of Isaiah. And it's Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 through 53, verse 12. And what it does in that uh, passage is it, is it paints a prophetic portrait of the Messiah as the suffering servant. In the, there are 15 verses, and you can break the the section down into five stanzas of three verses each. The first and the fifth one talk about exaltation. The second and the fourth talk about rejection. And the third one in the middle talks about redemption. And so it all focuses on what Jesus Christ means to us as it looks forward to what he would do on the cross for us. So let me pray for us before we jump into the passage. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we could meet together even when we can't meet together. We thank you for the unity that we have through Jesus Christ and through uh, your word. Father, I pray that uh, your scriptures would be an encouragement and would remind us of how much uh, Jesus gave his life for us and how much you loved us to allow your son to uh, die in our place on the cross. And so we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, the first uh, stanza of this uh, passage is uh, the last three verses of Isaiah chapter 52. And it presents the idea of exaltation. And though he was unrecognized, the Messiah would be successful. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he would startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told, and they will understand what they had not heard about. What Isaiah does is he directs our attention to the servant of the Lord. He says that the servant will act wisely, which means that he will do what it is that God wants him to do. And as a result, the servant will be successful. Now, by human standards, Jesus was not attractive during this period of time while he was on the earth. During his trial and during the crucifixion, he became so disfigured that people were repulsed by his appearance. And the first thing that we notice about a crucified savior is that he looks well crucified. And yet it was through his extreme suffering that it gave him the power to cleanse us from our sins. And in response, people would be struck dumb they would stand in silent awe in slack-jawed amazement. And that leads us to the second stanza in the first three verses of chapter 53. And though it couldn't be imagined, the Messiah was rejected. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot like a root and dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, 
a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Surprisingly, there were so few people that would believe the message about the servant. There would be so few that would acknowledge that the message came from God. And the responses go from simple astonishment to outright rejection. There is nothing about his appearance that would attract a following. It describes it and says that Jesus did not have Hollywood leading man good looks. You know, people might say pleasant and complimentary things about Christ. They'll, they'll praise his ethics. They'll praise his teaching. They'll proclaim him as a good man, as a prophet. They'll say he has the answers to the problems of society. But they will not, however, acknowledge that they are sinners and they deserve punishment and that Christ's death satisfied the justice of God and reconciled us to God. And today the servant is despised and rejected and we do not value him at all. That takes us into the middle stanza, verses four through six of Isaiah 53. And it presents the idea of redemption that Though we deserve the punishment, the Messiah would take it on himself. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray and we have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Isaiah describes the servant as being characterized by grief and by sorrow, by carrying that burden. But it wasn't his own grief. It wasn't his own sorrow. God was not punishing him. Instead, he was carrying and bearing the consequences of our sin. The essence of sin is going your own way rather than following God's way. The tendency of sheep is to follow others even to their own destruction. And as human beings, we are no better than sheep. That's not a compliment. And yet it also says that we are no longer without a shepherd because the shepherd gave his life for the sheep, namely for you and me. That brings us to the fourth stanza, which talks about rejection. That's in verses seven through nine of Isaiah 53. And though he was innocent, the Messiah would silently submit to suffering. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without any descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. If you've ever gone to a state fair and watched when sheep are sheared or shorn, you notice that they will do that without any making any sound at all. They will be submissive. That's the picture of what Jesus Christ did for us that he submitted to his death because he knew of how it would benefit us. Though he was oppressed and afflicted, he went along without a sound. His death was not a show of weakness, it, but it was an exercise in deliberate control. He was not overpowered. He was not a victim. 
but he chose not to fight back. If his life ended right there with the grave, he would have been considered an admirable hero, but it would have been a wasted death. And the empty tomb that we celebrate on Easter Sunday proved that there, were, that there was more to his death than anyone realized. Well, that brings us to the fifth stanza of this song, which is verses 10 through 12 of Isaiah 53. It's the idea of exaltation, that though the Messiah's death appeared to be a tragedy, it was all part of God's plan that would result in victory. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. The suffering and death of the suffering servant of the Messiah of Jesus Christ was clearly part of God's will. See, none of this was accidental. It was all intended. It was all part of God's plan and purpose. His suffering was a guilt offering, but not for his own sins, but for us, for the sins of the world. And through this, God made him to prosper. His suffering led to life. And because of his substitutionary work on the cross that it was completed, he can now justify those of us who believe in him. He bore our punishment so that we would not have to die. And because of his sacrifice, now we can be made righteous. Now, while Isaiah doesn't identify who the servant is in his prophecy, we who know Jesus Christ as Savior know that all of these prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus took our sins on himself and made full atonement for them. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He himself knew no sin, but he suffered the just for the unjust, that we sinners might become righteous before God. Let me uh, pray for us and just give thanks for what Jesus Christ did for us. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to die for our sins. Father, thank you for this picture that was written so many hundreds of years before Jesus Christ ever walked on the earth, and yet it pictured what he would do for us. Father, as we now partake of communion, I pray that you would remind us once again of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Before we take time to celebrate communion, I would encourage you just to take a moment for silent prayer to ask God to search your own heart to see if there's anything that perhaps is blocking your relationship with him tonight. So take time to pray, ask God to show that to you if there's anything there, and then take time to confess that before we continue on and celebrate communion. So let's pray. Amen. Why don't you take your bread or your crackers, whatever you have. As I said, uh, we're using a bagel, which is Jewish in uh, nature. Does have yeast in it, so doesn't quite count, but it's close. But as you partake of the bread, remember that Jesus Christ 
was broken for you, that he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. His body was broken for you. As you partake of the bread, do this in remembrance of him. Why don't you pick up your cup or your juice and prepare to remember that Jesus Christ poured out his blood for you. As you partake of the cup, remember that all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own way. And yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Remember that Jesus exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Through the shed blood of Jesus, we have forgiveness of sins. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he took our place on the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness that we have through his death. But Father, thank you that his death was not the end, that he came back to life to show that he had conquered sin and death, and that through that, we can be forgiven. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. May we never get over how you poured out your grace in our lives so that we could be part of your family. And we thank you for that in his name. Amen. Well, thanks for uh, joining us this evening for this time of reflection and communion. I would invite you to uh, join us again on Sunday morning as we celebrate the resurrection. I'm going to be sharing from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which asks the question, what happens if the resurrection was just a myth? What have we lost? Because we're going to see that the resurrection is central to the entire message of the gospel. Well, have a good rest of your evening, and we will see you on Sunday morning. Take care.